Ladies and gentlemen, she is an inspiration of a generation. Please welcome back Shane Gould. Hello. Hi. We please, please don't um, uh, get overwhelmed with, um, with the things that I've done, but I am 65 this month and I'm greedy about life. You know? Yes. So I love that. I, 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 like <clears throat> I like to take opportunities. I seek them out. I have a curious mind and I apply myself and get things done. So, um, so often I find it very difficult to... You know, I, so I, I might list things and I'm just going through my mind that, oh, did I do that? Did I do that? And, um, but, um, but, yeah, I, when I was younger, I'm... I, who I was then is who I am now, and I used a lot of those. Um, just just who I was at fifteen, uh, just in, innate characteristics to be able to block out those distractions that Ariane said that can occur, and to <clears throat> to reset. You know, I, I had um, seven events to swim. There were two relays. You know, five individual events. And you had to reset, like she, she described. I was right with her when she was describing that, how you had to manage, you know, to say, OK, that one's finished. OK, put that aside. Now get ready for the next one. Well, Shane, you've given me the starting point because I've, I was thinking, wh where do I start? Uh, uh, of everything I've just listed, wh where do you start? I was actually going to start about the Sydney Ferry and do you have to pay to, to sail on it? But um, you give me a good starting point there. 100, 200... 400, 800, 1,500. How, how do you go from sprints to long distance? Like they, well, it doesn't just, happen now. You, you turn a switch. It's about how fast your molecules go, you know, so, and, and also your, your mind, your experience, your imagination. So you just, you know, I just knew, you know, to, okay, this is 100, stand on the blocks. Okay, Shane, this is 100 free, 100 free, 100. It's not a 200 free, two laps, okay? Um, but it is, it is hard to, you know, to switch, but my, my coach was able to train me, a perfect match between um, my coach Forbes Carlisle, sadly he's passed away, and it was perfectly suited to, to, to what I could do. But these days, I think it's probably never going to happen again uh, because to, do, to be able to do the hundreds. Like we didn't swim 50s in my day. I think they only started in 1992, somewhere around there. Yeah, um, so the, the hundred was the the, 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 the sprint, and uh, but but the competition is so much tougher. I'd, I I think I'd be scared, you know, with with the depth of competition there there is now, and so so you really have to specialise. You know, do the hundred, two hundred. Perhaps you could do the hundred, two hundred, four hundred, or two hundred, four hundred, eight hundred. You know, but um, but usually not the hundred and the fifteen hundred. No, not at all. And, and you see. You see someone, and the physiology. You have a look at Kate Campbell, who is is built. She's she's mu she's muscular because she's got to go quick and in the fastest time possible. You had to do that, but then the fifteen hundreds, when they're they're lean and it's distance. It's, I mean, it's the same when you're you're athletics. The one hundred meter sprinters and the fifteen hundred meters, they're completely different physiology. Yeah. Yet you were able to do it easy. Yes, there are Sorry, different... Sorry, not easy, yeah, but you were able yeah, to do are, it. <laughs> yeah, there certainly are different body types, but I think my physiology allowed me to do it and the training that I, that I did. And, you know, when, um, I, uh, when I, was, um, I was at school and uh, at the end of 1971, I, was, I broke my first two world records when I went on a trip to Europe in the, um, um, at London, Crystal Palace... And I equaled Dawn Fraser's world record. Then I broke the 200 freestyle. Oh, and, and the 400 freestyle I, I broke. I was racing against Debbie Meyer, who was like my nemesis, my American nemesis, like Katie Ledecky is Ariane's nemesis. And when I came back, you know, I went back to school and was in full training. And they had these Friday night races. It was great to have, have these Friday night races. If there was... You know, they did three events and Shell sponsored them. So we had these little ribbons and they were events to qu try and qualify and for, the, for the state title, for, yeah, for the states. And uh, so I did the... I, I broke uh, the 200 freestyle world record. 
went back to school the next week. The next week there was the 800 freestyle broke that and the next week I broke the 1500 freestyle. So I was at full training and so, look, when you're young you can do a lot of things. Yeah, yeah, a lot of things. Well, you did them better than most, I can tell you. Where, where, were, this, where were these meets happening? Like, oh, just... just Birong Pool in Western Sydney, you know? Re just a no, reg 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 regular backyard pool, you know, regular, yeah. you know, this council pool. Like mm. nobody's business. I love yeah. that. Now, what I found out um, today, because Ariane said, now, Ariane and Dean, they swim at St Peter's, or at least coach at St Peter's, St Peter's Western. And Arnie said, there is a, a house at St Peter's called Gould House. It's one of the, the houses. That's named after you. You were a St Peter's student. I was, yeah. You lived at Jinder Lee. Yeah. We're yeah. claiming you as a Queenslander. <laughs> That's what we do. Yeah. So our Queensland, our latest Queensland legend, <laughs> Shane Gould, ladies and gentlemen. My, I went to more than seven, maybe eight schools, you know, in my, in my um, years. And uh, I think that helped me to be able to get along with different people, you know. And, um, uh, but my father moved around a lot. Remember, I was only young. I was staying at home. My parents supported me. There was no... Um, it was, everything was amateur. So my family had to support me to... You know, did, didn't have a chauffeur or someone pick us up. We had to use the family you know, gas tank and the money to go into that and um, you know, buy me special clothes to go out to events. And it was quite a tough time on my family. And uh, it put a lot of pressure and... Um, uh, being a special one in the family, and I had three other siblings. Uh, but my, my father did move around a lot with his work with Pan Am. You remember Pan Am? Um, he was the marketing manager and he, uh, for about 20 years with Pan Am for Australia. And he couldn't go any higher in the company because he was not an American citizen, which is interesting. So when we, um, yeah, we, we moved back to Sydney after he uh, got as far as he could in uh, Brisbane... And uh, he gave me the opportunity, I think this is wonderful, that my parents were, were like my manager, my psychologist, you know, my, my media liaison um, and masseuse sometimes and cook, yeah, and private, private cook, um, um, driver, yes, thank you. And, oh, but my, yeah. my, my dad, yeah, I, I was very fortunate to, to have them to, to support me and they... That they brought their expertise to, to, to my life, but, but it was very hard for my sisters. Yeah, they, uh, three sisters, they became Shane Gould's sister. So they wanted to be Debbie Gould, you know, they wanted to be known for who they were. So it was really difficult. So, so when, you, when you have a successful person in the family, the, other, the rest of the family, you know, suffer a bit. And when it came... Um, came time, you know, after the Olympics, about a year after the Olympics, um, I just felt an instinctive thing that um, it was going to be more of the same. I was going to keep breaking records and be the fastest. You know, that's confidence for yourself when you're 16. Um, and I th I, I'm a project-driven person. I like to be stimulated and I was concerned about my sisters and um, how the family's resources was going to them. And um, um, so I... Uh, no, stop swimming because I also did get a commercial offer that uh, that I took up. But uh, I remember that what I was going to say about my father, um, that he... Uh, I was talking to, to Nat earlier about agency. Quite often athletes, you know, you see these usually in, in footballers and it's changing, fortunately. But, but a lot of people, it, it, when they finish with their sport, they they lack the life skills to manage real life, okay? F sport is not real life, okay? It's, it's an addenda to, to life. So, the, um, so real life is, you know, washing the dishes and making your bed and shopping within a budget and, um, you know, getting along with your neighbour and, and you know, paying your bills. Um, very ordinary, but often athletes are treated as special, you know, and... They, they lose the... They, they become, develop a, an arrested development, you know. So they might be 25, 30, and they're still acting and behaving like a teenager because they haven't been given the opportunity to make decisions for themselves and, have, and 
learn agency, gain agency, which is the ability to con make decisions for yourself and control your life direction. Something my father did, I probably under the influence of my mother, was um, when we moved from Brisbane to Sydney, because that was where the, the main office and the planes were coming in and out of Sydney from, um, from LA and Seattle. And <clears throat> um, uh, he said, look, there's the, the, the two best coaches in Australia, because I was starting to, you know, to, to shine on the Australian stage, I was breaking short course Australian records, and they knew that I, I was pretty keen about my sport, about my swimming. So they said, look, Forbes Carlisle is one coach and he trains in ride. Okay? Um, he's got pools in ride and pimble. And Don Talbot, he's out in Western Sydney. He's, the ne he's another really good Australian coach. And who do you want to train with? And I said, look, can I have a try? You know, can I try out? Now... So I did. So I went and had a tryout with um, Don Talbot, and then I had a tryout with Forbes Carlisle, and it just meshed, you know, with with with, um, with 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 Forbes. I think if I'd have trained with Don, I wouldn't have lasted very long. He just was not my type, and he was just um, more focused on distance swimming. So with Forbes, he's yeah. So so the coach is important, but. But the thing about my parents giving me that opportunity, so I owned that. I owned that decision and that gave me a lot of self-confidence and agency to control my life. It's a big step, a big process, a big moment. How would you have gone under Boxall, do you reckon? <laughs> He's not here, so... <laughs> um, I, I'm a person that likes to... Um, I, I, I like concepts and I like essences. I don't like detail. So I think all the, the, the things that Dean was talking about, yes, yeah, certainly I'd, I'd do the spying, you know, I'd do the stalking, I'd, <laughs> I'd gather data like that. Now that. That's one reason why I was, you know, got, got through Survivor because I was able to use my stalking and um, spying abilities to observe people's body language and conversations when they thought I wasn't listening. Um, so I, I could do all that, but it's the detail. I can't cope with detail because I, I need to see the essences. Okay, what's the principles underlying these essences? Give me the principles and I'll work out the rest. I'll put the... I'll join the dots, you know, the, the essences and the concepts. I'll put them together. So I don't think I'd probably work real well. And, and Dean's energy is really up and I'm much more of a contemplative sort of person. <laughs> so, we, you know, I, I really like the way, though, he, you know, he, he said, you know, dog shit, you know, that, that, that event, you know, because, because there are more races afterwards and you have to be real, you know, you can do better. He say, so he's putting the, you know, like, what did you, you know, he's putting the challenge out there, look, Arnie, that, that was okay, but you can do better. And so, so I would rise to that, I think, and, and yeah. It goes to show the importance of the coach and athlete and how, yeah, meshing and, and gelling and, and, and getting on. What was it like for you watching that and, and seeing her do the, the, the double? You were the last one to do that. Um, I've, I've been following Ariane as she's imp been improving and I think one thing that she was really good at was... Um, but having been in Tasmania, she was a natural swimmer. She was still sort of had that, you know, like you have the country mouse and the city mouse. Well, the country mouse is sort of a lot of tenacity, a lot of just natural talent, and you just sort of work it out, you know, work things out. I was going, going to say to Michael when I was sitting next to him um, that when I, I talked to Bill Roycroft, the great Australian um, equestrian, and I asked him about his horses, where he rode his horses, and they, um, he said, oh, they're far, you know, we, we ride them across the farm. They, they, we jump ditches and logs on the farm. We, we round up cattle with them. So they're, they're athletic, they're sure-footed. And I said, well, do you think that that's got an influence, if, if that's been influential, in how athletic and sound your horses are in competition? And he said, oh, yeah, of course, of course. And I said, well, what about... 
them being like country bumpkins. And he said, well, you can polish them up, you know, and they, you might, might not be, be quite as fancy, you know, as your um, New Zealand thoroughbreds or your, your German warm bloods. But, yeah, they, as long as they were sound and sure-footed. So I think that's the same, same with your country bumpkins, you know. The, and so, so Ariane, even though Tasmania is a very polished place, um, you know, Ariane, she... Um, I think coming from the country, you have to use your own instincts a lot more. Uh, the thing I was concerned about was when she came to Queensland, that she'd be over-coached by the scientists. And the scientists would grab her and try and make a name for themselves by nitpicking her stroke, her, um, you know, her, her rates, her mechanics of, of a stroke and, and micromanage her and she would lose confidence in herself in her own abilities and defer to the scientists and say, oh, you tell me how to swim when she knows how to swim. So that was what I was really concerned about. And when, when the Olympics were delayed for a year, I thought, oh, God, no. It's another year for the scientists to interfere. Yeah. So she had the mad science. I, I, she had I Dean. Think, I. Yeah, I think. Yeah, yeah. I th think the sort of science that, that Dean applied and his um, his approach. So when I was watching, yeah, it was very tense um, for me. And then of course the comparisons started to be made, and so I had to think very carefully about what I said to make sure the focus was on Ariane. And I did see that change. You know, when when Ian when the eight hundred came on. And someone was saying, "Oh, you know, Ariane's going to emulate you. You know, in, you know, she's got you got a, she's got a gold in the 200 free, a gold in the 400 free, and now she's going for the 800." And I said, "Well, I hope she doesn't emulate me because I got a silver in the 800." <laughs> 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 but she did emulate me. She got a silver. <laughs> so we're twins. Yeah. And f exactly right. Yeah. And f and from Tasmania as well. That's where you call home. Yes, yes, yeah. I, I live there now, but I, you know, I did a lot of my swimming, so I was a country bumpkin, you know, um, came, learnt, learnt to swim in Fiji and um, you know, swimming around the islands and in the rivers and uh, out, out in the ocean. And I think, you know, I was, had a lot of confidence, a lot of um, uh, sensitivity to the water because I was in the water a lot, did a lot of playing. A lot of Marco Polo games, a lot of backflips off the diving board, you know, a lot of swimming underwater and pretending that you, you know, that you're a fish underwater and just all that imagination that, that, that movement can engender and swimming just creates lots of wonderful opportunities for, for your imagination and um, so that's where I started. No, I, I, I love that Fiji because that, that yeah. takes everyone back to their childhood when you dive into that water and the fact that you were then able to do what you did and have an affinity with it, I, I absolutely love that. I, have, I spoke to you before we did this a couple of days ago just to sort of pick your brain a few ideas and I knew this was going to be a hell of an interview because of the way you deep think and nothing that we spoke about, you spoke about to me the other day. So I'm learning along the way too. So I love this. This is brilliant. I do want to ask you about Munich 1972. Obviously, your Olympics... You're 15. Did you need a... Like, I mean, a 15-year-old at an Olympic Games, it happens a lot. Well, it happens... Yeah, it's not rare now, but was it rare back then or...? or yeah, so the, the, the swimmers in the 1970s, the, the female swimmers were mostly sort of late teens, yep. 16, 15, 16, 17. Uh, I think now the average age is around about 22. So, so yes, we were very young. We, we needed chaperones and... Um, but th we seem to have a maturity that you know, to, to manage things. Um, but yes, yes, Munich. Um, it, it was a child. No, so, so swimming essentially, elite swimming. It's becoming more of an adult sport. So when John Bertrand became president of Swimming Australia, he was just learning about the sport. He thought he could. He thought he could help to raise the profile of swimming and like, like he did with the America's Cup. And, and make a pr Australia proud of its swimmers and, and its swimming culture. And he, but when, after he'd been involved for a little while, he said, Shane, why do, why do the swimmers get up early in the morning? You know, what, why, do they, why do they have to you know, do, um, you know, sw start swimming at 5.30 in the morning or 6 in the morning? And I said, well, they're children. 
they have to go to school. And probably the, the coaches have to go to their day job because it doesn't pay very much. So, you know, he was just blown away that, that the sport of swimming was so different to his sport of, of um, yachting that was an adult's thing. Yeah, so, so I think it was a children's sport, but, but now it's becoming more of an adult sport, and so as a result, the adults are able to advocate for themselves and demand you know, more opportunities to race and actually get paid for it when they race and compete. I'm tipping you had to grow up pretty quickly, considering the world spotlight was on you in Munich. You, you, you came in with, I think, 11 world records you'd broken in the year before. I mean, you, you were, you were the, the, the hunted uh, over there. Um, tell me about the Americans and the T-shirts they wore. The, the Americans were frightened of me. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Where's Tracy? Oh, no, she's gone. <laughs> yeah. um. No, look, there, there is a great rivalry and, and always, once you've finished your races, you know, you just sort of, you just hang out, you know. We're just kids again. Um, uh, but the, the coach, I can't remember his name, but he, um, he was the head coach of the US Olympic team and in order to inspire his swimmers and try to psych me out, he had a T-shirt made, all that glitters is not gould. Okay. <laughs> And when I, I didn't actually see it, but I heard, I was told about it, and I said, good, they're frightened of me. <laughs> so it was a boost to my confidence. And yeah, yeah so it backfired on them. <laughs> but, but I think it was really interesting. I was looking at the history of it, as I do. I'm, you know, my, my husband calls me the research department. <laughs> so I always look, look into things. And um, uh, um, I looked into it, and in 1971, Led Zeppelin had the hit song Stairway to Heaven. It was about, you know, drug addiction, um, but, but there was that, that line um, about, you know, that gold and, you know, all well, that glitters isn't gold, yeah. But, of course, it was a play on the, the, um, the, the saying, all oh, that glitters is not gold. So, um, so I think he, he was trying to be cool, you know, as an... Uh, you know, as an adult with the younger swimmers and connect with them through Led Zeppelin and Stairway to Heaven and this funny saying and then it backfired on him. <laughs> no, that's good. We love that. It's a good story. Exactly. Sh Shane, sadly, um, your swims weren't the only thing to grab the headlines out, out of Munich. Where, we, where were you when the Palestinians yeah. came? Well... Some of you would remember that there were a lot of um, airline hijackings in the 1970s. The Palestinians had a point to prove and they had a, f a phase of using aeroplanes to hijack to get their point across. You know, it wasn't a really good way to do it, to get their point across, because it caused deaths and um, you know, tragedies in families. So they tried to make a point um, uh, at Munich and this, the, um, they, they took 11 Israeli uh, coaches and athletes, mostly the weightlifters on the Israeli team, the men, uh, took them hostage and um, de made, made demands and then they, the Americans got involved with the um, German police and the Israeli police and um, secret services and they were able to get them to come out and go to an American base and they were going to get flown somewhere but um, there was an American sniper and he um, shot at the, the open helicopter but one of the Palestinians pulled a hand grenade and blew up the, the helicopter. So this, the swimming finished on the Sunday night. The swimming is usually the first week and the athletics the second week. And the swimming finished the Sunday night and in the, it was the next morning and Keena Rothhammer, um, it's, no, it's not her, that's Lynn Vidali in that, that picture um, on the, um, the signed poster. Um, Keena Rothhammer beat me in the 800 freestyle and then we were playing, we were pillow fights 
No, I went, went with, with her and another Australian gold medalist, Bev Whitfield. She won the 200 breaststroke and second in the 100. And um, we, you know, 15, you know, it was, you know, we had Coca-Cola in a Mars bar, you know, <laughs> and played pillow fights, you know. <laughs> and, I'm just looking around, looking for Julie McDonald. I'm seeing Curly here. I'm just thinking that's not their memories of the Olympic Village, no. I'm sure. But, um. so, but, so, so that's just to, to emphasise that I was a child, you know, but in an adult world. So it was all a bit, you know, just over the top of my head, but I could physically perform. Anyhow, so, so the following morning, you know, where, where we end up falling asleep, uh, actually, yeah, it was quite tense because Keena and I went for a walk in the tunnels, the supply tunnels, and round, around about four in the morning, around about that time, those Palestinian guys were climbing the fence to get into the, into the, the room. So we could have run into them, yeah, but we didn't. Yeah, it creates a bit of tension in the story. Um, <laughs> so, so we went back to, the, to get breakfast because the t Australian team was going to go to, um, go to a, a, a nearby city to do a... Um, a demonstration swim or just to, you know, be received, you know, by the mayor of the city. And we went to go back in... There was no-one in the, in the dining room. We thought, what's going on? And the waitresses tried to explain what was happening. We knew something wasn't quite right. Went to walk into our, you know, to, to, to the room to get our swimming gear and our kit. And there's guys standing with machine guns, you know. And I thought, is this a movie or something, <laughs> you know? It just didn't register, you know. It was just such a, such a disconnect with the whole idea of the celebration of youth and athleticism and, you know, shared, you know, shared playfulness in playing games together. It was just a disconnect. So they escorted us, you know, to, to our room. We got our gear, went out. And then when I came back, my, uh, there was still a lot of tension, I think, think all that drama played out. I stayed in the village for another day while they had Avery Brundage, the president of the IOC. He said, the games must go on. He affirmed it and they did. But my parents and the Australian team officials took me out of the, of the village. And so I watched the rest of the games. I had tickets to the gymnastics and the equestrian and, and athletics and, and I couldn't go to any of them. I had to watch it on TV from the outskirts of a little village one good thing about that was I was studying German for the school certificate. <laughs> so I was able to practice my German. You're still thinking and about I school while you're at the Olympics. And I got an A for German. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you always find a good thing out of something, can't you? <laughs> um, I will del delve into the academia world in a moment because um, we can see you are the head researcher, a, a double masters and PhD in philosophy, but... In between doing those, you decided to get dumped on a deserted island with the clothes on your back with about a dozen strangers and take part in Survivor. Why? Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm not really into reality TV, but... I but have, you blitzed it. But, but I... No, but... So I was writing... The, I, was, I was editing my thesis. So it's the end of 2017... And I was editing my thesis, and it's really hard. Anyone who's written, you know, a master's or, or a really, you know, decent research essay, you know, so I've got 357 pages, you know, of, of writing, and um, I had to sort it, you know, had to prune it heavily. And I thought, well, what am I trying to say? You know, what, what, what have made my questions? What am I trying to... How have I found the answers to my questions? Have I found them? So... I was in this, you know, just sitting at my computer and just scrolling through things. I'd print out, and I'd think, I'll print it out. So I'd lay the pages out, and oh my God, you know. Um, and so, bing, pops an email into my mailbox. And I have a look at it and said, Shane, would you be interested in going on Survivor? <laughs> and I thought, yep, take me now. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds it. Who sends those emails? <laughs> oh, look, they, they, have, they have people who... The casting agents, they're the casting agencies, and, and so they, they reach out to people and you know, sort of throw, throw the net wide. 
And so I said, look, I don't really know much about the game. And she said, I can see it on, you know, replays on, 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 I've, on um, um, 10 Play. And, um, and so I said, look, give me a few weeks. So over Christmas, New Year, I had my iPad and I'd be washing the dishes and I'd be watching, you know, an episode and I'd watch something else and I'd be, you know, chopping some onions and, um, you know, and, and my husband said, what are you doing? I said... I'm actually watching Survivor. He said, oh, that's a stupid game. <laughs> and then I said, well, actually, I've been asked to go on it. And he said, oh, you wouldn't go on that. And he shouldn't have said that. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I said, well, well, I'll just look into it. <laughs> so, uh, well, yeah, well, yeah look, it's, it's, a, it's a very interesting game. You do have to be strategic. You do have to be um, deceptive. But it's a television game. But sometimes, you know, yeah, yeah. And, uh, I justified going onto it, and so I got fit. I made the climbing wall on the side of my house. I had ropes that I was hanging off. I had bungees that I was swinging off, and I ran in the water. And I went and used the basketball hoop at the the primary school. I spent about three months, you know, doing some, you know, acrobatics and preparing for it, and. Because I was 62 at the time, you know, and I knew there'd be younger people. But I, I watched through watching the episodes. I, I thought yeah, I'd be able to play this game. So yeah, I went on it, and um, and after eight or ten days, I thought this is a stupid game. <laughs> I don't know what's going on. I can't get along with these people. They're not my people. Huh? What am I doing here? And we weren't supposed to talk to the producers. But one guy, I used to get up at night and, you know, do a thing, um, do a pee and, you know, and, you know, in the low... Just on that. Were there toilets? Below. Yes, there was a toilet. Okay, yeah, right. private, yeah, a little private space. You could have a long... It was a long drop, but, um, but hygienic. And um, so I talked to this guy. I said, oh, you know, I really don't, you know... You know, I'm not really enjoying this, you know. And I thought, I really like the holiday on the beach, but, you know, when's the, when's the excitement going to happen? I love stirring the fire and chopping wood and all that. But, you know, I could do this at home with my family, you know. And he said, look, Shane, you're doing great. And I said, oh, am I? You know? And so he, he, he shouldn't have said that, but he did. But he gave me encouragement. But I, they had a psychologist as well because, you know, people can go... You can go a bit mad... And you, because it's it's game relationships, it's not real relationships. And although I did form genuine relationships with people, um, but the the psychologist was very helpful, you know. And I said to, said the same thing. I said, Look, I, I don't feel like I belong, you know. I'm always on the outer, and and he kind of said, How old are you? How old's the, well? The next youngest person was twenty years younger than me. And most of them were, you know, old enough to be... ..or young enough to be my children. So he said, look, you have a different perspective on life. You're doing great, you know. What do you think you need to do? And I just, and he said, you've got the answer. So the psychologist helped too. So after that, I really got stuck into the game... ..and really worked out on the... ..worked out the strategies, you know, the game plays... ..and I realised that I was invisible... It wasn't beca because I tried to play under the radar, as some of you, know, you Survivor fans hear about. People try to stay under the radar. You actually have to take risks and be noticed. But because I was an older woman, I was made invisible. People, they just didn't take notice of me and they thought, oh, Shane Gould, the swimmer. Well, what have I... No, they, no one asked. What have you done in the last 40 years? You know? <laughs> I said, well, where do you want to start, you know? <laughs> I'm an animal trainer, you know, I round up sheep, I can class wool, I can, you know, split logs, you know, split fence posts, I can... Um, I, I was the Western Australian state ploughing champion with a pair of horses and a single furrow plough. Where do you want to start? <laughs> I've got four children, you know? <laughs> you know? Um, they didn't bother to find out what my capacities were. So I was just there picking up big data, you know. I was watching all these people because I, I could read people, because I could read animals. I could read, 
you know, are taught swimming for years. You know, you read body language, you know, and so, yeah, yeah. So they, they missed out on getting to know me and I just, I didn't sail through. There were some mighty tense moments at times um, and some disparaging moments. Actually, my husband, he's just a wonderful man, but he, <laughs> he, um, I asked him for advice and he, he, he knows me well. We've been, been together for, you know, since 2002 and um, he... I said, final advice, Milt. And he said, look, Shane, you've used, been used to being treated with reverence and respect. In this game, you're going to be disparaged. You know, there will be times and you're not used to that. And I'm so glad he said that because that helped me to get through. But the second thing he said, just keep your dignity. Yeah, he said, keep your dignity. So there were the two bits of advice that really carried me through the game to, you know, in my contract I said no nudity, you know, and, um, uh, and, and they said, well, Shane, if... if and, and I said, I've got a really good reputation, public reputation. And they said, well, if you act and behave and say things in a certain way we can only, and we film that, well, that's how we have to depict you. So I was just authentic, I was genuine, you know, just myself. And, um, and I was rather wicked sometimes and I loved it. <laughs> <laughs> I think they're great rules in life. Don't worry about winning Survivor, I think they're great rules uh, in life. What, um, can I ask? What did, what did you spend the half a million on? <laughs> I can ask, but you might not answer. Yeah. Is that what you're thinking? <laughs> well, I... I had a car. I, I, I had a little Subaru station wagon that I'd had for 17 years. So um, that uh, I sold that. <laughs> Actually, it broke down. It, 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 it broke down on my way to Launceston, and um, I sold it to a local guy. And his son took it and sold it for $300. So I didn't have a car. I had a Land Rover that my husband and I shared, and. Um, <clears throat> um, and so I bought a car, you know, a nice safe Volvo. You know, I like station wagons, but actually it saved my life because I had a car accident about three, three w months ago. I drove off the road into a ditch. I surfed this ditch, you know, like this, and it came to a stop. But the car was written off, but I've got another one now. Um, I fortunately had it well insured. So, yeah, I got a car. I felt so wonderful in this lovely Volvo. <laughs> Pressed the windows and had heated seats. And, <laughs> yeah. Um, so I just I just treated myself. <clears throat> I bought a camera lens. A, a, a camera lens. A, a camera lens. I like to take photos. Yeah. And I bought a wetsuit. A six hundred dollar wetsuit. You know. Because you swim every day. Because I don't swim you? every day in the ocean, so it was nice and toasty warm. In Tasmania, yeah, you and, need two wetsuits. And I bought a stand up surf no stand up surfboard. But then I still had a lot of money left over. <laughs> 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 so I very carefully read Scott Pape's Barefoot Investor. Talked to my children who'd read the book. And I just sat on it and thought, well, what do I do with this? How can I maximise this? And I wanted to build ourselves a nice little cottage, you know, uh, you know with, with things that worked, because I live in a house that things are very small and compact, and I like it. But you know, I thought, OK, we're going to build a cottage. But I thought, well, if I spend all that, then there's going to be nothing left. So I saw a block of land in Bishano, and... Um, I thought, well, if I buy this, then I can strata it and then I can probably double my money after five years. So I built a house last year on this land. I was the, the handy person. I put in about 4,000 deck screws, drilled each hole. You literally built I the house? I literally, yeah. Li okay. I was, the, I was the, um, the trades person alongside my builder, yeah. <laughs> So I'm pretty handy with, you no know, Milwaukee tools as well. But but and I'm you not. You thought this was going to be a <laughs> swimming, right? Yeah. Hey, yeah. Shane, girl, <clears throat> how good? Look, um, look, I, 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 working with your hands and your tools, it's it's a, and and your body, it's it's about you no know, being an athlete. 
Um, I was talking to someone doing a podcast about sports career transitions the other day. And he said, what would you recommend? And I said, well, first thing is you've got to keep moving. When you finish your sport, you've got to keep moving. Because that's how athletes express themselves in the world. You need to use your body to express yourself in space. So, so when I, I lived on a farm, you know, and ran horses and had a cow and yeah, built, did some building work and fencing work and surfed, <clears throat> surfed a lot um, in Western Australia where I lived for about 30 years and where I had my four kids. And that marriage, you know, broke up and um, moved on. But, um, but the thing I loved about being on the farm, it was only, only 100 acres... Um, and I, y y you need to use your body. You need, you know, as long as you're not not using it as a machine. So, so that was the way I expressed my body. And then when I had my fourth child, I thought, oh, this is like doing a 1500 over and over and over again every day. <laughs> this is this is this is why I trained to be an athlete. You know, trained to be a swimmer so I could be a parent of four children in five years. You know. <laughs> I finally, Four and five worked, years. I finally worked out how that happened. Yeah. You know? <laughs> ATV where you live, right. Okay. Um, Shane, you, you mentioned about using your, your body, but using your mind. And mm. two yeah. master's degree, the doctorate in <clears throat> uh, um, um, philosophy. And I said to you, just an off the cuff remark, I said, Oh, sports in our DNA. And you pulled me up real quick. You said, Why? Why would you say that? And I actually, yeah, I, I had to stop and think about it, but you have explored that and almost deconstructed that, haven't you, as part of your thesis? Look, it's very easy in our world of one-liners, you know, little, you know, short, sharp quips, you know, for the 10-second grab for TV or your funny anecdote in a tweet, you know. Um, it's very easy to try and shorten things to slogans. And one of the slogans that I investigated in my PhD that I did through the Victoria University in Melbourne, um, uh, and it was in the sport and culture group. So it's, the, it's a, a study um, of the culture of swimming in Australia. So it's not competitive swimming. It's just, you know, learn to swim, swimming in a river, swimming in a dam, um, um, bou bouncing around in waves, you know, just, and then, then definitely the structure of it, you know, the politics of it and where it fits in Australian identity. So I, I questioned the saying, Australia is a nation of swimmers. And I thought, well, because I've been working in drowning prevention in Fiji and Sweden, uh, my husband did work in Sweden with elite athletes and so I often went with him and we ended up doing this project about for, for people who are scared of the water you know there are a lot of migrants leaving the Middle East and going and Sweden was resettling them and so there were a lot of people who couldn't swim or who were just dead scared of the water so we designed this program so so I've been involved in yes in Fiji doing these village programs for water safety and drowning prevention and so in my experience you know, because I've been at the elite level, but I've also been at the learn to swim level and the drowning prevention level. And, and <clears throat> so when, the, when I saw this saying, Swimming Australia, and the media repeats it, uh, Australia is a nation of swimmers. I said, well, they're not. Because only half of the population, half of the kids who leave primary school can swim 50 metres. And probably a lot of them fake that. And you no, know, they hold their breath, or um, and the the highest drowning rate amongst Australians, you know, th a third of the drownings occur with men between fifty over fifty five. Eighty percent, guys, eighty percent of the drownings that occur in Australia are males. So I ask you, don't trust. I tell you. Don't trust your swimming certificate. When did you last swim 50 metres? If you, had, if you fell out of a boat when you were fishing a kilometre offshore, could you get to shore? Could you help someone else to get to shore? Go and test yourself. You know? So swimming isn't one of those... Yeah, certainly, once you know how to swim, you know, once you know how to swim, you know how to do it, but it also needs fitness and skill 
And also, you need to know how to read the environment. So how deep is the water? Is the water moving? Where are the currents? You know, what's the weather doing? What's the wind doing? How's it influencing? So there's some of the questions I asked. And so, so, so one, of the, one of the statements, it changed from being Australia is a nation of swimmers, it evolved, the slogan evolved to swimming is in Australia's cultural DNA. Okay, so they, because a lot of business people were going onto the board of Swimming Australia, they brought in the business culture. So they were talking about business culture and, the, and, and there was a popular book about cultural DNA of companies and businesses. So they borrowed that idea for a human activity. So for a social sporting organisation and put that into that, in, into swimming and use that slogan and it doesn't work because it's not DNA. It's not, you know, de you know, I've read his most difficult book and paper about DNA and what, what that means, how, how information is carried or transferred or um, social and cult um, biological information is transferred. It doesn't transfer, okay? It's, yeah. But this is philosophy, okay? Um, <laughs> So, the um, uh, so when I when I challenge the idea of cultural DNA, first we had to say, okay, it's, they're talking about business culture. They're not talking about human relationships and practices and language and clothing. And so, one of my chapters in my thesis is swimming as culture. So, sport as culture. So we often think of culture as being art and drama and music and movies. And, um, but sport is culture and Australian and, and swimming is culture. So I argued that point. Rather than saying it's in Australia's cultural DNA, I wanted to change the framework a little bit and say, OK, sport, no, swimming is culture. So what are the, what are the things in swimming that make... Swim, no, Australian swimming, Australian cultural swimming, Australian. The other, the other thing I questioned was, um, was why is it so important that we say these things? Australia is a nation of swimmers. Well, you know, they say that Australians have got, got cultural cringes and there's been lots of, you know, discussion about that and um, every time Anzac Day comes around, you know, who are we? Well, we're the Anzacs and... Um, but that's a long, long time ago. Um, so we ask, who are we? Now, this has become a bigger, th a bigger issue now that um, borders, international borders are blurred because of international communications and travel and the sharing of you know, culture with you know, dress and music and um, books and movies. And so, so the, the, it's blurred and there's a... a kind of a, a, cult, a, a national crisis of identity, you know. So, so, so we think, okay, what makes people in France French? You know? What makes English people English? What, make, what, what is an American? What is an Australian? So it's not just a question that, you know, we say, okay, swimming, you know, Australians are swimmers. Well, we're not because a lot of people drown. 200, over 280 people drown each year. And a lot of people can't swim very well, you know. So, so you, you have to think, well, if they can't swim, we'd better not use this identity, but it's still important to know who we are. And um, so, so that's the challenge of a philosopher and that's some of the things I wrote. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And it, it's so interesting to get the, that challenge because... Every four years when the Olympics rolls around, we, we jump on that and we jump on the success that you had, that Ariane has, that, that Julie had, that all our Olympians have. And maybe it's a bigger picture of sport in our DNA and how we decide to go with that and how we embrace that and how we will embrace that in 2032 yeah. with, with the Brisbane Olympics. Are you going to... Are you already jostling to put your hand up for that? Because I know you were part mm. of Lighting the Flame and... In, in Sydney? Yeah, that, that was a different... Sydney was a different kind of thing because that was a hun the 100th anniversary of women being part, 
part of the Olympics. That, that wasn't emphasised a lot, but there were seven of the great Australian uh, female Olympians, you know, carried the torch in the opening ceremony. And as I do, you know, I had to, had to run a quarter of a lap. What's that on 400 metres? That 200 metres. Yeah. Is that no, the two? no, 100 metres. 100, 100 yeah. metres, thank yep. you. Uh, um, so the t torch... Two laps of the pool. OK. <laughs> the torch was handed over to me by Shirley Strickland Delahunty, and I think there's a picture on the, on the, one of the, on the poster one of them, there yeah. um, of, of that handover. And then I had to run another 100 metres and I handed it over to Glennis, Glennis Nunn and she ran down through the athletes and handed it to Cathy Freeman. Um, so, but, um, you know, I had to practice running. So I... <laughs> I lived in Margaret River at the time, so early in the morning. But well, you were the WA ploughing up. champion. Yeah. You, you've got it. But that's walking, a yeah, walking okay. plough. <laughs> um, so I pick, I'd pick up a stick and I'd make sure no one was watching. I'd run around the back streets, you know, with this <laughs> <laughs> one arm up in the air, and yeah. So I had had to look good. Um, look, uh, I don't know. Look, I think there's a, a lot of younger people who are better known to be involved with the, the Olympics. But I do have one thing that I'd like to. Um, talk to Nat about and um, uh, about what is needed for athletes, you know, for, for the athletes. And one thing I wrote about and discovered in my thesis was that athletes are surrogate diplomats. Okay? So Ariane, I bet she's met politicians, she's probably met ambassadors, she's, you know, been, you know, been with... You know, the movers and shakers in, in business and, um, um, and culture, you know. So, but she's not trained. She, so we assume because they've got sort of, you know, athletic ability and they inspire people that automatically they can talk politics or talk about Australia, you know. So I think that one thing is needed, and this is where I come in, I can work in the background, you know, with policy and changes and whether I design something and, or deliver it or push it through, you know, I work, you know, give the information to someone like Nat who can um, then implement it. Um, you know, so, so, so athletes as ambassadors, I think, and diplomats, you know, there's... Um, that, that's that's an area I think that I, I would be involved with to make to, to advocate for the athletes and have their experience to be a, a rich and rewarding experience and not to feel like a dork, you know, you know when when you're mixing with with these really important people and you can actually be an effective diplomat and representative of Australia by talking about it knowledgeably. Well, you're certainly in the right room and in the right city to do that exactly. We could talk all afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Please thank Shane Gould. Outstanding.